Hi, I'm Ryan O'Connell, the creator and writer of Targets, Mac Maverick, and I am the writer of Merge Rum and Inheritance in the Bebop Volumes 1 and 2. You can find my link tree and all social medias at Ryan OC, the number four and the letter U, and you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a new guest on the show. Uh, we were supposed to have him back on earlier in the year. Things didn't work out. Schedules got crossed, blah, blah, blah. The usual stuff when it comes to a pandemic. But he is here today. We are joined with the creator of not one, not two, but three comics today, at least one part of an anthology and two separate comics. He has a, a comedic, yeah. comedic background as well, too, because I'm just going to stumble over words now because I edit all this stuff myself. We are joined today by the ever-talented Ryan O'Connell, creator of Targets uh, and Mac Maverick. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for getting me on, Kurt. I, <laughs> I'm a big fan of the show. so oh, I appreciate it. Uh, you're the only one that's actually said that that's come on. So I, <laughs> oh, I think you're a great interviewer. I think there's a, a lot of stuff uh like comics interviews get a very pluggy very quick um and i like that you actually kind of get into the surface kind of some some background stuff some introspection as you kind of said pre-interview yeah well it's it's something that i don't think a lot of people get to talk about they usually talk like you said it's a, it's a plug type interview usually is what they're on and they don't get to really dive into the artistic process or the writing process for that matter in your case and and it's just something that's kind of evolved over the years but enough about me you're already on the show we'll talk about of course yourself as a creative person for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking yeah, uh, my name is Ryan O'Connell, and uh, I'm the creator of Target's Mac Maverick, and I have a story featured in the newest uh, volume of the Bebop, uh, titled Merge Room. And I am uh, a newer comic book writer, but I've been reading comics my entire life. I grew up uh, learning to read on comic books, and everything I kind of do is getting me towards making more comic books. Um <laughs> And yeah. Well, I mean, everyone has to start somewhere. That's the main thing about this, whether you're you're a comedian or whether you're in, in a comic writer, a new or veteran, you you always start with a single page and a single word for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, I kind of started with that in school actually. Uh I kind of had the perfect kind of one two punch of the best kind of teacher combo in third grade and fourth grade. Mm -hmm. um, third grade, I had a teacher who was kind of hands off, I'll say in the nicest terms. Uh, she would come in and kind of say, free reading all day. Um, and I would be like, okay. And eventually I was kind of falling into comics at the same time. Uh, I had a grandfather who was a fan of old movie serials and kind of pulpy comics. Like uh, he was reading The Spirit and The Shadow and Green Hornet and all that kind of stuff and showing me those kind of old movie serials, uh, like the Kirk Allen Superman, mm -hmm. where it was so cheap, where when he flew, he had to turn into an animated character, uh, <laughs> which I, I love so much. Um, and I had an uncle at the same time who was into 80s and 90s comics, so kind of that hardcore metal, you know, chains and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I kind of grew up with this kind of perfect meld of what I thought comics could be, you know, very moralistic, but also super aesthetic you know it's always kind of going for the most exaggerated interesting image but it has that kind of moral value underneath i think that's what comics can really do you know that's what it is being a textual and a visual art form um so i was kind of falling into love with comics at the same time and kind of bored at school and so i started getting those giant words waldo books at the library and then drawing comics behind them and I eventually did things where I was, you know, making deals at lunch, you know, exchanging uh, some of my baked goods from my grandma for my friend's comic book characters' rights so I could do crossovers. Um, you know, I was always very nice because I was going to comic book uh, conventions really early, uh, thanks to a very supportive uh, pair of parents. And I was asking these comic creators, like, what should I be doing? I want to make comics all I want to do. And, you know, there are some older creators who, you know, there's the saying comics break your heart. And some of these people I've met had had their heart broken. 
And they kind of instructed me to, to kind of take care of the people that I was always working with. And I think that's why I love collaboration in comics too. Um, so I was making these comics in, in school and I just kept going. And then I got into fourth grade and then I had an extremely supportive teacher uh, who would do amazing book clubs and stuff, but I could read whatever I wanted to. Um, you know, she would walk up and be like, oh, what you reading? I'd be like, well, you know, Watchmen. And she'd be like, cool, okay. You know, I hope it's it's good for you, a fourth grader. Um, you know, and I was, I had these journals that I had to do in class and I would fill the back with comic books and try and still do my journals in a loose form. And I didn't know I was still doing my journals and she was letting me do that. So I also substitute teach uh, when I'm not doing comic book stuff. And I think that's just because I think amazing teachers and not so amazing teachers form people, creative people, especially, I think, um, and hyperactive creative people like myself. <laughs> it's amazing, especially in, in a young life, when you have just one teacher to inspire you down, you know, whatever creative path it may be. I mean, even those that just take the time and, and I grew up in the eighties and nineties and for, for school. So that's a completely different time than, right. than today's schooling. But you just, you always remember that one teacher that would literally just uh, support you when you either maybe didn't have it, or maybe you didn't know what path you were going on in, in life in general. And, you know, to, to become a teacher and most of my families are teachers as well too, is, it's a it takes a special skill and a special empathy towards people, and I think that's very difficult in today's society. They wear instant gratification, especially when it comes to comics and comes to art forms, whether it's photography or whatever, is is amazing skill that people don't understand, or they just take everything else for granted. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and honestly, that's why I just substitute teach because I put teachers on such a high high pedestal. Uh, especially the ones that commit as hard as they do. You know, there's um, some really messed up prerequisites for being a teacher now that they're aware of walking into a building, right? Um, and so being able to go into a classroom and just kind of help in any way I can, um, at least just keep the class intact over one day or two days, you know? Um, but then we also get some kind of free time because of how you know, a free day or a substitute day is kind of structured. So I, of course, always kind of implement some comic stuff where we talk about, you know, anything that they're really interested in. I give them some challenges, you know, work the word Mike Wazowski into your morning, you know, <laughs> journey. Um, you know, because kids deserve to have a good time too. And I, I think there's, uh, sometimes we get uh, in the way of our, our own um, purposeness, uh, our purpose, our own drive and, and we forget to entertain the people around us and ourselves. Um, there's a, a lot of comic stuff that I was working on for a while, including targets that got, was just dark, you know, and I think merge room does it too, but there's, uh, I always wanted to kind of give it a thematic purpose and then kind of, uh, find an artist or work with editors that are finding an artist, uh, like the bebop because they found Amanda, uh, Darador, um, a uh, French artist, and she's incredible, that kind of depicted Merdram in that kind of uh, painted storybook style um, because it's it's not a sweet story. It's a, a I'll spoil it, it's about a brother murdering a brother. Um, uh, uh, that's at least the central premise. And that's a, a kind of serious uh, thing. So comics, I think, have that, uh, that ability, like animation, um, to exaggerate to the point where you're telling your story in the most satisfactory and any way possible, right? Um, when you lift a really heavy weight, uh, you don't, you feel like your arms are going to fall off, but your arms don't fall off. Uh, in an animated show, SpongeBob, I'm thinking of probably his arms fall off. And I, I love that more. <laughs> and I, comics do that too. Let's look at your comic itself here. You've touched on a couple of them here, um, and and we could easily dive into the the educational system of both Canada and the U.S. as well, uh, for, for for most of the interview. But uh, it's great that you're incorporating comics into your teachings, as well as the fact that you're you're a creative person yourself when it comes to a comic writer. 
we were originally going to talk about targets specifically, but now that you brought up the pulp aspect, and I've had a few pulp creators on in the past as well too. Let's start with with Mac Maverick and talk about that concept and where we can find it as well too. Because I think I saw it on Webtoons, something like that. Yeah, it's on Webtoons and uh, Tapas. Hmm. I actually love that you can just Google Mac Maverick and it pops up. Uh, <laughs> Pretty awesome. But yeah, Mac Maverick came out of this just incessant need to make comics. Um, and so through kind of talking to other creators and stuff, I found a few resources uh, to engage with the comics community uh, at whichever level you're at, you know? So the one that I really found that was useful is the Reddit page r slash comic collabs. Um, you have to kind of get in and then when you post, you kind of just lay it out. You, you tell them where you're at in your career, where you're at financially, you show some work maybe, um, and whoever engages with it, engages with it. And it's the internet, so it can be a crapshoot for sure. Um, but I found uh, this amazing person, artist, uh, Danielle. Um, and you can just find him at Danielle Draws uh, on, I think, Instagram and Twitter. Um, and Dan is awesome because he kind of also started in a sort of criticism writing aspect. He does some work for Panel X Panel, uh, analyzing some comics work. And so he also had a love for uh, not only like pulpy comics, but uh, serialized newspaper comics, uh, which I really love. So I got, you know, the, I'll just grab them right now. What a plug. Uh, the su uh, Superman Sunday strip. Uh, which I found at like a really cheap half rice books, gorgeous. Um, and all those Dick Tracy. Uh, and my grandfather was a huge fan of a serialized strip called Smiling Jack. And Smiling Jack was sort of uh, an offshoot, uh, you know, Terry and the Pirates adventurer kind of thing. He was a pilot um, and he went on all sorts of different adventures, right? Um, and I never really read Smiling Jack, but I knew Smiling Jack through my grandfather, through my papa. He would sign cards as Smiling Jack. And so when he passed away uh, a few years ago, there was kind of this thing where all of his stories that he was telling were descending. And I just kind of wanted to catch as many as I can for my family. And at the same time, I was looking, uh, I was finishing college I was getting this kind of media, this vague media studies degree where I was just eating genre stuff as much as I could and I needed to make something out of it that I wanted. And so I kind of found this melding of Indiana Jones and up uh, through my grandfather, through my love of genre and pulp uh, and newspaper and through what Dan was looking to do, which was grow his art style and do something where he was on deadline and creating a newspaper style comic strip that was releasing three times a week, uh, three to four panels. So we were trying to do an entire arc. So we kind of went into a hole and developed this kind of character, you know, looking at all these sort of instantly iconic characters, you know, that's what Mac Maverick is sort of kind of be a, a like faux iconic sort of uh, character. So Mac Maverick has lived an entire life. I always kind of love those stories that almost feel like the series finale of a TV show or an entire series that started, you know, I think back to the future is like, just like that. Um, you know, where there's this entire relationship, there's all these adventures that these, uh, this older man and, and teen boy went on, you know, uh, before they invented time travel. Yeah. Um, and so Mac Maverick kind of picks up when, after all of that, when he's in a assisted living facility, um, called Happy Trails, uh, Living Home. And he has a uh, sort of distant relationship with his entire family. Um, this is also kind of incorporating my relationship uh, with my other grandfather, uh, who is uh, uh, past 90 and is uh, has onset dementia. Um, and so he is definitely uh, retained by his past and his connection to his past. And so he is a, a World War II veteran uh, and all this kind of stuff. Oh, sorry, a Korean veteran. Um, and so I kind of wanted to kind of do an homage to both of my grandfathers through this way and tell an interesting story that I thought uh, with elderly characters, which I thought aren't usually um, the heroes uh, of the story. And I also wanted to incorporate some things that we didn't see in other pulp stories. So um, 
he uh, Mac Maverick has a grandson, uh, Jack Maverick, um, which are also two of my cousins, just more family homages, Jack and Mac. Uh, are, uh, and so, uh, and uh, Jack is uh, a black boy, which you just don't really see in newspaper comics uh, unless it's racist, uh, which I didn't want to do. And that was something uh, that Dan kind of introduced through like his studies of all of these kind of things. Dan is an amazing writer, like I said, that uh, does work for Panel X Panel and other places online. And so Mac Maverick was kind of designed to just have a, me and Dan make comic books, uh, just keep pushing and, and finish a story at first. So our first story, uh, Mac Maverick Flies Again, uh, was I think almost 20 parts uh, and then ended with a full page newspaper style, uh, which I bought from Dan and it's my first ever piece of original art that I own, uh, which I love just so much. Um, and we're now halfway through uh, our next arc, which is called Mac Maverick and the City of Stolen Stuff, <laughs> uh, which is kind of a riff on, you know, all the criticisms thrown at these adventurer types who kind of just plunder cities that are still inhabited sometimes not just lost or, or deserted um and so there's kind of a generational uh conflict that happens between jack and mac um which i think is kind of interesting and in the way that those kind of characters progress and the story kind of progresses uh me and dan's creative relationship has changed too so i started by writing out all of mac maverick flies again uh just in a full script form and now we're actually working in that original kind of Stanley Jack Kirby Marvel style. So it's where I wrote a plot. Well, I wrote a plot, not for a whole issue per page, uh, but I wrote uh, about a paragraph per uh, strip or per page that we're doing now. So we're just doing a full page like on Webtoons. Um, and then Dan would send me thumbnails. We'd go back a little forth. Uh, he would do some kind of temp dialogue, which I sometimes use and incorporate in the story. And then I would do the final like dialogue pass and he would do the pencils and inks. Um, so it's this very collaborative, very like, you know, it, uh, my favorite thing about Mac Maverick is that it kind of started from nothing and we're just kind of throwing clay at it and molding at it uh, as we go, you know? Um, and so, you know, the story isn't always a hundred percent as tight as it would could be. Um, and, you know, I definitely know that Dan has to work very, very hard, uh, to get these pages and these strips done. And I'm so thankful. And so we kind of give it that extra time because we have no editors or, you know, publishers on our back. Um, so we are kind of in a hiatus. So Dan can kind of refresh and recharge and stuff like that before he gets back to drawing, but he is doing writing work. So go and check out his stuff. Um, and Mac Maverick now has just become this uh this world so we did two shorts in between our arc uh called dork support and bobby bulb finds a human uh two kind of anthology pitches that we missed the deadline on honestly uh and we were like oh let's just do them anyways because they're kind of fun so they're two kind of like goofy fun kind of world expanding uh shorts that kind of introduce some other weird characters in the mac maverick verse or as Dan has dubbed it, the macroverse, with it, which I, I love pretty much. Uh, yeah. The pulp comics are rather interesting because I remember reading yeah. like um, a Buck Rogers in the 22nd century and then, uh, or 25th century or something like that. Because my uncle was into comics. He, he got me into comics early on in my life. So he, had a, he has a very eclectic collection of, of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was great to see like that type of uh, a style, and and there's been a lot more a resurgence, I think, of of pulp comics in modern day comics, at least from a either a Kickstarter campaign or a crowdfunding campaign perspective. But what's misunderstood about pulp comics that maybe today's generation doesn't understand that you grew up with? So I think something really important to remember about pulp comics is newspaper comic uh style pulp comics especially um that my grandfather is introducing me to is that these guys were churning this out every week um you know we're at webtoons on mac maverick so we kind of have time to just kind of go in the back work on our stuff and when the arc is far enough along or completely finished we start releasing um these artists usually it was one person, um, you know, and they were turning around uh, several strips every week. Um, 
And I, I think that's something that I still love about the comics art form is that uh, for most comics, you still got to churn one out every month. Uh, it keeps you going on tracks. So you have to kind of lay it down. Um, yeah, that kind of also leans into a lot of stuff where there's some messy mistakes in comics. And I think there's some messy mistakes in pulp. And uh, that's why you find a lot of stuff there um, outside of just uh, internalized stuff and generational stuff. Um, but, you know, in, in, in pulp comics, it's, it, it was really just seen as quick entertainment. Uh, and I think that's something that is uh, kind of looked down on now in, in comic books is, uh, you know, I still call them funny pages. I, I love doing that funny books. Um, you know, I give comic books to anyone who asks, um, but I, I never act like they're sacred. I think that's kind of one of the most interesting parts about it is that you can pick up sometimes a comic for still 75 cents. It won't be a new comic, um, but it'll be new to you. And you can leave it on a park bench and then someone else will pick it up. And, you know, I think that's always uh, the argument of, you know, where do you get people into comics and all that kind of stuff. Um, my first issue of Wolverine was like 276 or something like that. Uh, and it wanted me to go to 277 and 275, right? Um, but then I also then, my first ongoing comics that I all jumped into was the Heroic Age for Marvel. And that was because it was the first time there was a true relaunch that I felt I could jump into. So I think the other thing with comics is that they should be accessible. Uh, Mac Maverick, I always tried to write it uh, in a way that uh, it's, it's that three panels that you get every week is its own little story. But it's also continuing the story uh, to make it go forward and following up on the cliffhanger that it ended on last week. So I had, you know, kind of a satisfaction bit and a cliffhanger every kind of week in three or four panels. And I thought, wow, this is so cool because this is what they had to do, you know, at the same time in the in 30s, 40s, 20s, all, all the way back. Um, something I love about comics is that it is, um, while super worldwide, so much of comics is like an American art form as well. Um, and so I did kind of incorporate that kind of stuff through my grandfather's love of Americana and all these kind of fifties aesthetics and all that kind of stuff as well. It's amazing. Like this, this particular comic kind of refreshes the, the archeology archeologist um, motif. And I think it's something that is, I mean, you know it well through Indiana Jones and the fact that they're making a sixth, fifth or sixth film right now, which is almost done wrapping up as far as I can recall mm. is, is fascinating. I mean, who would think that a singular character could pull a franchise that that far? And you're you're definitely doing that with Mac Maverick as well too. And I'm sure other stories you've read in the past have similarities, similar to like Marty McFly and, and Doc with time travel basically spawned Rick and Morty of you know <laughs> the animation of today. So it's the segues and the similarities of of popular culture that we're engrossed in and what we grow up on is, is great to see being evolved and, and transformed in, in comics. Yeah. And I mean, if you, uh, you know, Indiana Jones himself is this full amalgamation of those serialized heroes, right? Um, he was just so good that he became the new blueprint. And I love that he had, you know, Nathan Drake and Lara Croft and all these kind of spinoffs and Mac Maverick. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, and I think so much, you know, there's the popular term, like everything is a remix. And I think um, I, I kind of don't completely buck at that. And I think the more helpful thing is that um, people love a sense of uh, familiarity. Uh, sometimes they might call it ownership. Uh, but that is an amazing opportunity for you to introduce new ideas and new story paths. And I think a lot of my writing stems from that kind of idea and concept. You know, um, I come from the Jonathan Hickman school of you have to still sell a book. It can have a lot of cool new ideas in it, but it can't be super, you know, um, uh, inaccessible. You know, there has to be some sense of familiarity to start on the right foot and then you can steer them in the wrong direction. You know, uh, Mac Maverick definitely starts in that where it takes a sort of iconic figure, a serialized hero and ages him 50, 60 years, um, hundreds of years, depending on how you look at that timeline. <laughs> um, 
but the targets uh, also comes from that came kind of same idea where I was in college developing targets, um, studying a lot of media ethics and the way that uh, violence and motivation is explored in action and all sorts of thriller movies and stories. And I also found it kind of in this spy genre. Um, the motivation between an action scene uh, is sometimes super, super flimsy, which I'm fine with. I love, you know, pulling out a rocket launcher and all that kind of stuff and blowing it up. And I think Targets kind of has that in it. Um, it's the kind of idea of how far could you push that? Um, and so Targets sort of starts with the idea of a uh, super spy-esque character, right? Like a Jason Bourne, James Bond, one of those types, and a femme fatale, the woman hired to kill him, a Bond girl. And we're picking up at the end of their story, like I've kind of already said, and they have fallen in love and they've decided, let's just kill all the bad guys. Let's just wipe out all the supervillains and we'll be done. And they do that. They settle down in the suburbs of America where everyone is too obsessed with themselves to wonder who's next door <laughs> and who their neighbor could be or who their neighbor was or who their neighbor killed or who their you know neighbor spied on. And so we pick up uh, with this, this family uh, farther on. And of course, the past is starting to come back. And this might kind of seem like a familiar story uh, that you've seen before. And Target uses that as kind of uh, a jet engine into some kind of new territory. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, Matt Fraction. Matt Fraction, I think, is why I am making comics, uh, not just why I read comics. Uh, he got me reading my first indie comic, Sex Criminals. What a start. Uh, and so I got, you know, I was following his sort of idea, and he kind of broke down Hawkeye, I think, in an amazing way and just most comic book series. And he has this theory where the first issue, and if I, I'm off, I'm sorry, Mr. Fraction. Um, the first issue is kind of your fake setup, but your, your interesting setup. And then at your, your second is issue is your first true issue that's showing you, oh, this is what the series is gonna feel like. And then subsequent issues change whatever your story or what you thought it was going to be. And so it kind of has three actual stories built into it, sometimes only in three issues. And I think you see that in that uh, Fraction uh, Hawkeye book where that first issue, he just gets the dog and not building. And then the rest of it is, oh, there are these individualized adventures. And then the end of it is, oh, this is an exploration of a hurt human being and his family. Um, and I try to, to write comics like that. Uh, Targets, I think, is the closest I've hit. Where I promise you, if if you know, as uh, as we go on in issues, if we're lucky enough to keep going in this story, you're gonna see a real unfolding of of what we're going for um, while you're being entertained the entire time. Uh, I like I said, I I write stories trying to be aware of how they could be accessed, uh, just like a comic book could be picked up right off the shelf in a third issue or fiftieth issue. I want that to be satisfying on its own. And you're going to see that reflected in targets, just like you see it reflected kind of strip by strip in Mac Maverick. You connected it with Mac Maverick and that shows your style of writing. That shows you're trying to make things familiar and, and it all works out well. So I don't have to ask what targets is about now. Then looking at targets itself, obviously you have a different artist and a different creative team for this as well, too. I co-created targets uh, with Desi, uh, uh, Alessia Aponte and uh, Dee Noonan. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time. Um, I co-created Targets with Desi Alessia Aponte and Dee Noonan. Uh, they are the two uh, co-creators of Targets, and they are also the two artists of Targets. Um, I found them uh, farther, uh, kind of at a years-long process in trying to get Targets made. Um, there was uh, another artist that I worked on uh, with Carlos Angeli, who's an amazing artist who does work at Mad Cave now. So he's doing uh, comic art and he's uh, fantastic. And so looking for a new artist, um, I was kind of inspired at the sort of dual narrative that Targets has. However, it kind of has these kind of framing sequences, these sort of 
many um, flashback adventures to sort of Sean Connery, Pierce Brosnan inspired spy days. Uh, so you're going to see a sort of Aston Martin car. You're going to see all those sort of jet ski kind of fights and all this kind of stuff. And that's kind of a burst of action that Dee Noonan is going to draw. And Dee has this amazing um, sort of classic inspired, uh, inspired, but very like geometrical and, um, and uh, angular sort of art. And so D is drawing this classic style. And then we have Desi, who is, you know, she bucks at the word perfectionist, but then everything she draws is perfect. Um, but she has this super detailed style that is very uh, three-dimensional in a way. Uh, it, rem it has this sort of underground indie comics inspiration that Desi will, will talk about. Um, and it is this kind of perfect contrast and complement uh, complementing with each other where we have a past timeline and a present timeline and it shows kind of of course how the present is much more gritty realistic and in your face than the past which is idealized uh maybe a little more um beautiful these characters you know and uh angular you know so what was the scene that you all created that turned out better once you got the art for it the best part was there was a, a opportunity because I had had a couple scripts finished already when Desi and D uh, came on and looking back at it and looking at their art, I was like, Oh no, I gotta, I gotta change this because there's just things that these artists do so well. And then there are things that I know I want to put in the story. And then I kind of kind of put that together. Right. So Desi draws these super intricate uh, kind of, almost every kind of panel and page is, is a splash, right? And so I want to give her that kind of space to put the detail in where she wants to be. I don't want to do a lot of close-up sort of, uh, you know, frames and stuff like that and, and panels because she's going to put the detail and she's going to draw the eye where she wants. Um, D is also one where she kind of is uh, always reevaluating that kind of uh, page construction to kind of give it even more of that kind of classic neo pop. Like she did one, uh, the actual first page that I kind of set up as like a Superman motif originally, like this is your hero. And it was like just the, the bow tie with the chest. So that's the original version. And then D turned it into pretty much the opening title credit from a James Bond movie, um, which is like incredible. And it, it, it uses the entire scene in a much more, uh, visceral way um and so both of those artists are bringing their strengths to it and that's also because i i grew up knowing i wanted to write comics because i knew how good comic artists were i was bowing at their feet from when i was born and i got rid of my drawing ability as quick as i could once i knew i could work with an artist um and i was studying a lot of comic book styles uh, something I love about comic book writing and comic books in general is that there are really no rules as long as it works, right? So comic book scripts, if you look them up online, there's tons of available online if you're looking for that. And they're very, very different. You'll have, you know, a single page as a comic script. You'll have 40 pages as a comic script. Uh, you'll have, you know, the the famous Alan Moore uh, his his pages of the comic script, right? And his, you know, the first panel of Watchmen is an entire page of script, right? Um, I don't write like that. I I, I kind of have this. Uh, it's kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of ones, but the people I could credit are Tom King, Mark Wade, and Brian Michael Bendis. Mm. Um, Tom King, I think, writes in that sort of. I think I have his yeah his um, Vision Deluxe Edition. They're also director cut issues if you're looking for them and they have the scripts in the back, which are a huge reference because they also have Gabriel Walta's pencils and stuff. Um, and so Tom King writes in sort of a very direct style where it's, it's all action. It's almost like writing a screenplay where you're not supposed to kind of give direction on how actors are supposed to act. Mm -hmm. He kind of gives that to the artist, right? That's kind of, he also credits to Mark Wade. And then Brian Michael Bendis, I think, goes the extra mile 
and includes a language within the script to enable the artist to kind of break things open. Um, and so I include a similar kind of thing that he includes in his script at the top where, you know, this comic script is a map and I'm only drawing the map. I'm not going into the jungle. If you find out there's a quicker path through the jungle, please do it because I'm sending you into a jungle. You know, comic book art is, is excavation. It's, it's creation. It's, it's incredible. And so I, I really trust my artists to kind of go the extra mile where they want to and don't expect the artist to break themselves over tiny things that not even I would notice. Um, and I, I think that that is, you know, kind of just designed to, to keep making comics too. It, it also keeps yourself fresh too. You're not, you're not struggling with a creative process, especially in a collaboration where you have to spell everything out. You have two other talented minds that understand the, the artistic side of, of making a comic book uh, to fit your overall goal which is to, you know, put forth an, an amazing comic series. Yeah, absolutely. And especially in like a creator owned comic like targets, um, we're, we're arm in arm together, you know, we're going, uh, where we go. And, and when we have that sort of, uh, announcement to make of where targets is and, and where you're going to be able to get it, um, we're going to be able to do that with our heads high. Something, you know, I think, is growing up on comics and growing up, I knew I wanted to make comics. I talked to a lot of comic artists and creators who went through the ringer. And the tough thing I think I'm seeing in the comic industry is that we're still just going through the ringer knowing it because we want to get our comics published so bad. And I think, you know, the, the, the onus is uh, on publishers, of course, uh, to uh, be better to their creators. And it's on the onus as us as well um, to create the work that we want in the best way as well. Uh, I don't believe uh, something good made in a bad way is still fully good. Um, there's something intrinsic about how I approach art and how I create things that if I'm not doing it in the right way and if i'm not feeling that my heart's in it in the right place there's something that i'm not just not going to be proud of and i don't think the quality uh will get by with without it you know and so there's a sort of care that i bring to my work and a care that i i try to have for my uh co-creators and my collaborators um that i think creates the best comic books, you know, the, the best comic book creators that we know, the best comic book teams that we know are friends, right? Uh, Sean Phillips and Ed Brubaker, Chip Zdarsky and Matt Fraction, right? Um, even when they're not making comics, they're friends in some sense. And that doesn't have to be exclusive, you know? Something else I love about comics is that you can make them in so many different ways. Uh, and that's reflected, I think, in my work and how I write them. Targets is a full script style that's then passed on to two co-creators who could change it as they see fit, right? Mac Maverick is created fully Marvel style where we're just exchanging script notes and dialogue and art and all that kind of stuff. Merdrum and uh, the anthology story, as well as the inheritance, my other story for the Bebop, was something where I just sold the script um, to the publisher and they found an artist for it and then came back and was like, how do you like it? Do you have any notes? Do you have any lettering changes? Which is super nice, which they didn't have to do. Um, and I, I think I, I love that kind of uh, variability in comic books, right? And so the option is just, you know, or I think the, the skill in comics is, is knowing where you're going and what you're getting into, right? You, you know you're not going to end up if you work for Marvel, you're not going to get out of there with the Spider-Man rights. If you do, what an amazing you know thing! But you're not you're not going to be able to somehow like work that into something. But it will provide opportunities for you to make create your own comics where it's 100 percent yours. And when that's the goal, it has to be 100 percent yours, and you get that. The ability to use a publisher or to find a publisher, uh, whether they're independent or or well established, all over the world. I mean. 
you have digital outlets now, you have Webtoons and Tapas, you have the ability to self-publish yourself with crowdfunding. You have so many more avenues that was not available 10 years ago, 15 years ago, especially when this show got started. Print on Demand was just starting. Comixology was just starting back in 2008 when that was still around. There were a ton of publishers, but they were not looking at self created pub self created comics for that matter they were more focused on authors and and creative people along that line and so you know the web comic scene and the independent scene that had to do their own grassroots movements to publish themselves just really has forced everything that we know in 2022 and beyond to give us more flexibility and, and more creative freedom yeah and i, I think that's you know, those sort of adaptations that comics are making are, um, are tied into its very heart, you know? Comics were always kind of these uh, super accessible, they were newspapers and they were magazines and they were on the side of the road and they were sort of looked down on in some ways, but that also made them accessible to more people than most art. Uh, and I think that sort of boom on the internet is, is no mistake. People want to get their hands on comics. It's just sometimes hard to get their hands on comic books. Um, and I think Webtoons is, is an amazing, uh, and all those sort of web platforms, any crowdfunding stuff, uh, is an amazing way to, to, to make your stuff. Uh, because it's, especially if it's the way that you want to make it. You have the freedom to, to do tiers and, and to promote yourself on social media. And, that, and that's something that, you know, is more vital than ever, especially with the social media platforms. We could have another hour just talking about that alone and how the algorithm is shitty to creative people if it's not art. Um, cute dog, by the way. I'm sorry. Yeah, he he is like, uh, you know, like the two, the two kids in a trench. Oh, my gosh. He's making, okay. saying the word woof. Okay. <laughs> His name's Butters, which is, which is pretty funny. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm sorry. What was your question? Like, Darn it, butters! I'm on a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Literally, I had some my horrible South Park impression. You said early on in life you went to comic book conventions, and I think that's that's truly the epitome of you know getting your geek card. You know, going to a comic book convention in that regard. You know, what was the second wisest piece of advice that you received from a comic book creator that you admired that has stuck with you in your creative journey? Trying to think of a good one. I mean, there's so it's so easy to just pull out a Chris Claremont one because he's mm -hmm. just so fun to talk to. I'm trying not to do the the uh, super basic just make comics thing because a lot of he a lot of them just do the the just make comics thing. Yeah. Um, which is it? It's pretty much how you do it, right? You just start, and but a lot of people just go, "Well, how do I start?" Uh, and so the uh, the Reddit one was a really good plug. I think I got that from a comic creator. Um, oh man, I wish I remembered who I got that from. The stuff that I really appreciated hearing comic creators talk about um, at comic conventions was the stuff I never saw on the page. Um, a lot of this comes from what we would call like mainstream writers and artists. Um, but I just want to really iterate how hard these creators are working for you as fans. And if you have some sort of huge ship or some idea or something like that, um, just know that most creators are, are working for that or they want some sort of satisfying resolution to that idea. Uh, the best plug I can give is, is Teeny Howard and her work on the Betsy Braddock, Rachel Summers relationship. Um, I heard about that C2E2 s ago because they were like, yeah, they're obviously in a relationship. Everyone's like, ah, obviously they're these two mutants, they're in love and they've tried to write this and they've tried to put it in. And there's a lot of things about changing immovable objects, right? Um, or, or IP as we might refer to them as. And so I think there's a lot of creators that are working um, for their fans and that are working to tell the best stories possible. And because of how comics are made and because of how entertainment is made and how art is made, 
sometimes that always doesn't get reflected on the page. Um, I also believe with a huge caveat that the art stands for itself too, right? Um, that you always can't give an entire preface on something and why it doesn't have something or why it turned out the way it did. Um, I think there is, a, you know, levels of understanding and that's um, what we should be trying to do and, and research the stuff that we're interested in. Kind of segues into a question I, I have here. You know, mm -hmm. what is a social stigma in comics that society needs to just get over? I think the comics industry and because of it, the comics creator stories and all that um, are super white fronted and they don't need to be, um, shouldn't be. Uh, I am a personal example. I think Targets is a personal example. And I will share this example because I think more creators should go into this, uh, this sort of work and, and don't avoid this. Uh, Targets I wrote on its own before I met Desi and Dee. Uh, I wrote ta Targets taking place in the suburbs of the Midwest in the early 2000s uh, as predominantly white, uh, as uh, what I thought was a point uh, on whiteness and how it's sheltered and protected and stuff. Uh, there is definitely still that angle in Targets. But when I was talking uh, to Desi and Dee uh, and they were going through it, Desi uh, was kind of like, hey, let me just give you a rundown of how I imagine all these people in my head. And she uh, said, Cherry, the co-lead of the book, right? Uh, the femme fatale turned housewife, you know, uh, is she said, she's Latinx. I'm reading this book and she, she's Latina. Um, and therefore her kids are mixed race. And, you know, without being super dramatic, I was propelled out of my body because I was like, you just made this story 200 to 2000% better. <laughs> Um, that's not something, you know, through my own perspective and through my own whiteness, I would have seen because I thought I was making enough of a point by excluding other people. And so, you know, that's what other, when Desi and D enter the, the, uh, the thing, when I bring in, you know, two women creators who are from different viewpoints of my own, they bring those viewpoints to the book and they make it better. And I really encourage other creators to just do that, to explore outside of your own mind and, and really try to buck that authorship idea um, because you're going to make something better together. And I think all of my favorite art is the art that you can tell is made by more than one person. Top Gun Maverick, that's a plug right there. That was, you cannot, you know, Tom Cruise didn't fly every plane, but you definitely know he didn't shoot that whole movie himself, right? you know? And those sort of bigger movies that, that don't feel as single tone or single voice are the ones that we keep going back to because there's other stuff in there because there's other people putting that attention to detail in there. And so I think that's what comics have intrinsically through this collaborative uh, sort of setup. But I think it's something we need to push for more uh, outside of our own uh, comfort zones and our own surroundings, our own backgrounds. I've been doing this for 15 years. I've had a, a wide variety of people from mm -hmm. the LGBTQ community, from persons of color, from yeah, entertainment professionals to uh, beginners in the comics and, and acting industries, whatever the case may be, entertainment. This is one of my newer questions I started to ask, only because, not, not for shock value or anything like that, it's only because it's just like, as much of an open forum as shows like this are, it's everything has rose colored glasses, is what I'm trying to say. And I, I really find that, you know, we need to, to peel back the curtain. We need to look at, you know, what is, what are issues people are dealing with and how can the medium that they're in uh, shed some light on that? And I think it's not a necessary evil and that's something I never really talk about. So. Yeah. yeah I, I, and I mean, I, I think it's, like you're kind of, we're kind of just saying it, it just creates better stuff, you know? And I think that it's beneficial to everybody. It's not just the rising tide lifts all boats. It's like, we're getting new boats. Like things are rising out of the ocean that we've like sunk. Atlantis is, is rising, you know? There are things that you've never considered. Um, and I, I think that's so, so cool. And those are the comics that I'm looking for. That's the art that I'm looking for. Uh, and that's the, the art that I want 
the people that I work with to push me to do uh, and the work that I try to push myself to do. And um, yeah. So then what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, okay. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll just do this one. It's, I, it's a it's a switch. I kind of had this parallel thing happen in sophomore year of high school and sophomore year of college. And it kind of opened my eyes up to art and to get mushy, the, the world in general. And the first one was a, a teacher in my sophomore year who kind of bucked away from all the other English teachers that I've had my entire life up until that point. And he didn't put any rules on the structure, length, word count, any of this kind of stuff. No, didn't care if you use linking verbs, all that kind of stuff. He just wanted to know what you were saying. And the first paper I got, I got like maybe a D, maybe like a C minus. And I was gobsmacked. I had written a perfect paper, right? Indentation, all that kind of stuff. No linking verbs. Perfect opening sentence, you know, with all the, the intro and outro, all that kind of stuff. And I got like a C. And I was like, why? And in the nicest terms, he told me, you didn't say anything. You wrote a paper without saying anything. You just kind of explained whatever book you were writing a report on. Uh, and you just kind of recounted a plot. And that was like, oh, there needs to be depth to the things that we do. We can't just kind of chew things up, and spit it back out. And I really brought that to, I think, a lot of my work because I, I do work in genre and familiar territories. And I want to only kind of take the essentials of that kind of stuff, the familiarity of it, and build on it. You know, I don't want to just give you something you've already seen. And in sophomore year of college, uh, I got back uh, from working at Disney World, all hail the great mouse. Um, and I just kind of wanted to throw myself into different stuff. And so I started doing stand-up comedy. Um, and I was just going, trying to do open mics, all that, going every night. And then I was writing, kind of trying to do new comics. This is where I started writing Targets for the first time. At the same time, I was taking two courses. One was an aesthetics of film course um, taught by a, a very intense teacher. And then the other one was a, a theater of the Holocaust class, um, which uh, is was taught by the head of a theatrical Holocaust remembers Remembrance Society, uh, who was traveling into Chicago every week. It was something I did for a credit. I didn't know what I was, you know, signing myself up for, and it was the best academic course I've ever taken. Uh, if you're at DePaul and it's still a thing, take the course. Um, and it really, you know, the seriousness of the subject uh, of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, and then implementing the idea of it's a theatrical approach to it, or sometimes we looked at film as well. Um, it made you deal with the most delicate hands, but you had to approach it in the most visceral, intentional way. And intention is, is the most operative word in this. And, and that's, this is, I think, the thing that I, I try to focus on the most in my work is that I am intentional in it and that I'm not you know, always, uh, I, I, even when I am doing something like Mac Maverick, where it's something that's always changing and adaptive, that's the intention behind the story. I'm not trying to throw that, you know, midway through uh, on something that I've already started on, like targets. And intention in the work and, and kind of through these courses, you know, you had to depict or display things in the most respectful way possible. And if you were not, you had to be intentional about it and you had to know why. And so because it was, you know, I think one of the most important subjects in academia, there should be just a course for everyone. I, um, that should be a requirement in, in, in genocide and, and the Holocaust and all that. And um, because it does make you think of intention in a whole different way. Um, not in a, you know, in, in just a, a humanistic way, right? In a psychological way, how a person could get driven to something or have to endure something, right? Um, but also bringing that to just everything else you're trying to do in your work or hopefully your life, you're doing it on purpose. Um, 
And that's when my art changed. And that's when everything I was doing changed was when I started doing everything on purpose, not just because I wanted to get this expression out. That's how you start in art, I think, is you have this feeling that you have to just like put somewhere and whatever you're most familiar with, comic books for me, that's probably what you start with. And then hopefully you then get to the process where you're like, oh, I'm making something that someone could read and get a story out of. And I got that in my first story I ever did um, as a, uh, a fully produced story. It's called Trains. It was uh, with uh, art by Casey Quevedo and Melinda Timpone and letters by Letter Squids. And it was a five page story that I did uh, again around when my grandfather passed. And the setup is that it is a kid who loves trains and his uh, family's like, why is he so obsessed with trains? And he connects with his grandfather on the couch. They're watching uh, the great train robbery. And they're like, oh, this is cute. Like the grandfather and the grandson both love trains. And that's awesome. And then the grandfather, you know, sneaks him out of the house. And he's like, you want to go see something? He's got two train tickets. And you're like, oh, that's so cute. And then they rob the train. (laughs) And the idea is that, you know, there's these connections between people and art or two people and their art or hundreds of thousands of people, thanks to the internet and their art with these communities um, that people from the outside don't completely understand. You know, you have to be in it to understand it. And I think there's like a special relationship you can have in that. And so, you know, when I put that story out, I, I had some people come to me and it was really flattering where they were like, I'm sorry if this is taking away from your relationship with your grandfather. Cause I did kind of release it as a, a tribute comic. And they were like, I, I kind of feel like it's about me and my grandfather because we had this thing that we did together. And I was like, that's, you connected with my writing, um, which is the best thing that could ever happen to somebody. And so, you know, the thing that I really, really encourage other people to do is try to meet people who will read your stuff, go to libraries. Librarians love local writers and artists and stuff. Show them your stuff. I, I had, you know, I'll plug my local library, Plainfield Area Public Library, um, invited me to their family fandom fest. Uh, and it was the best Comic Con I've ever attended. Um, it was just kids in costumes, checking out your stuff, giving out, you know, I was giving out kind of loose free sketches. And, you know, there's entire communities out there that will connect with you and your art on a really deep, deep way that you won't expect. Um, yeah, and libraries rule. Go libraries. My grandfather, since you brought up trains, and I'll bring this story up. My grandfather passed a couple of um, months ago, but All right. yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. But the he was a he worked for CN Rail with Canadian National Railway for forty years. Oh, awesome! And so I got to. So he worked downtown when the Detroit riots were going on. Uh, like he, he was literally across the river where he saw like buildings explode and shots being fired when that was going on in 67. Um, then he moved to uh, one of the other places, kind of more central, uh, central Windsor. But um, he had so many stories just to, to tell about, about trains and railways and, and everything like that. Um, so I, I wanted to, bring that up too so i got to see his other other place of work but yeah i took uh i took trains off because it was on gum road and like gum road sucks um so uh i'm gonna uh i'll send you that a uh, uh, copy of that cool yeah um yeah that's really thank you for sharing that that's really really cool yeah. uh i got five last questions here we're gonna do one well, last disconnect reconnect um, okay and then uh yeah we'll do social media and all that other stuff sweet Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? So the person that got me on the path that if I had to choose one person, because there's so many people that just rooted me on, I was very lucky for that. Um, But my my uncle Pat, uh, Pat O'Connell is his name. um, And he deserves this because he introduced me to comics and what comics were capable of, right? Um, So he gave me... 
uh, Incredible Hulk 340. That's the the iconic one when it's Wolverine on the cover, right? Uh, it's Todd McFarlane, I think, drawing it. And he's got um, Hulk in the reflection of it. And that was like my first real single issue that I like read and owned. Um, what a way to start. And the reason he gave it to me was to show me what comics could do that no other art form could do. Because I was growing up and getting into comics at the same time that comic book movies were becoming the most mainstream of movies, right? So I was watching uh, the early X-Men movies with Hugh Jackman, loved Wolverine, was running around with pencils between my fingers. And my uncle kind of looked at it, was like, that's nothing. You know, he's got to crack his neck every time he heals or something like that. He can't shake off a bullet. Here's a comic book where Wolverine and the Hulk fight each other. And I was like, what? They could do that? The Hulk and Wolverine could fight? And he's like, not just that, but Wolverine is going to like punch through him so hard, you're going to see the end of his claws going through the Hulk's shirt. You know, Comics Code prevented the full rip through, but you're going to see all that green blood and all that kind of stuff. And you know, as like an eight year old, my mind, you know, changed forever. And so that was kind of what set me on the path to comics was like what they could do versus what I was seeing everywhere else. And the more I dug and the more I saw was that comics can pretty much do anything. There are very few limitations in comic books. And if there are limitations, they're going to be broken eventually. Um, it's, it's an amazing art form. And you know, it's it's why I continue to mess around with it. From a professional standpoint, while you are new to comics, you still have created comics. So that means you are professional in that regard. You have created, of course, of course, you have created Mac Maverick, your targets with some amazing co-creators and as well as uh, have a story or two in an anthology with uh, Merdrum and uh, that other story. And you created Trains as well. So you have many comics under your belt. So you're professional in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? No, no. Uh, there is a, a definitely an unfair expectation that I think most creative people put on themselves. Um, but there is a sort of sense of responsibility, I think, um, that I owe to the people who have supported me. Uh, I kind of... You know, I, I always say like, oh, I was lucky to be born in the generation. Like I was kind of that first generation where we were allowed to read comics and comics were starting to get kind of cool, uh, or at least they weren't actively bullied for reading them, right? Um, but that's kind of not giving the uh, credit to the people who supported me, which were my parents who bought me so many comic books uh, that I tore through and stuff. And so I think a lot of creative people because there are some kind of unfair expectations sometimes uh, on, you know, artistic and creative pursuits versus other professional ones. Uh, but you recognize that the people who kind of hold you up um, when you're, you're really clawing and fighting. And so, you know, I, I, I don't think I will be fully successful until I've made a comic for every single one of those people who let me make comics. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Make more of them. Uh, <laughs> fail more. Fail more until uh, you succeed. I, I, you know, I think f there's the 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 sort of cliche term of uh, failing upwards, and I think that's just effort yields eventual satisfaction. Um, you know, if you're failing, you're trying. And if you're failing, it, it sucks at the same time. And I, I came from a sort of theatrical background with improv and stage work, uh, where a lot of it is setting you up, even in education, to be aware of what auditioning is like, right? And I think that has brought me a healthy mindset to submitting uh, to publishers and stuff, or, or, or studios or anything like that, where, you know, every no doesn't matter because you're going to get a yes if you keep getting no's, right? Um, it, 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 it is a perseverance thing and it is the easiest thing to talk about and the hardest thing to do. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's maybe as a comedian or a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form, you're inspiring them down whatever path they may go. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think the 
number one thing that this, you know, this more welcoming generation, I, I think my younger brothers are part of, um, is to hold on to a sort of changing, uh, this acceptance that reality is constantly changing. Uh, I think it's something that is hard um, because of the scenarios that have made reality change so quickly over the past few years. Um, but now there's sort of an adaptability that people are having uh, that we didn't have for a long time, right? It hit, uh, the pandemic hit for so long because we weren't ready for it and we didn't talk about it, right? Um, and I think the younger generations now have like grown up through it. My brothers graduated through it or going through college through it. And so I really, really hope that those kids and everybody just, just stay that welcoming. You know, I taught a, uh, during the pandemic, I taught an online, a set of online courses for homeschool children through a nonprofit. And the number one thing that I always stressed was like, engage as much as you want. Um, they could turn their camera off. They could mute the mic. They could change their name. They would, I would refer to them as, you know, whatever they would like to be. And I think that is actually, that prompted the most interaction out of the course that I could possibly get. And, you know, that's an academic kind of situation and social situation. Do that same sort of stuff. Open yourself up to your changing situations and changing environments. And if things aren't changing, change yourself up a little bit. Don't change yourself the joy of these you know open-ended questions is you can get on different trains of thoughts and it is what it is cool if your life was a comic book what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be Ooh. so i'm a big fan of the stanley approach of titling things alliterative or something like that I have this Fantastic Four, like old treasuring one, where it says the fabulous Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. uh, which I wish they kept so bad. So I would like to kind of keep something like that. Uh, Mac Maverick, I guess you can tell. Um, but I guess if you say my beginning of my name really quick, it's Rhino, right? So, uh, so Rhino might be a kind of fun one. Um, and the soundtrack would be... Oh, man. Okay. I've been listening to a lot of, like, Baz Luhrmann music. Not just Baz Luhrmann musicals, but the music that Baz Luhrmann made. I don't know if you've listened to any of that, but it's, I recall. it's bonkers. There's, like, one song that's just, like, positive affirmations, and so it's, like, to synth. Super, super weird. I would kind of want to make Rhino uh, a sort of genre bending weird kind of thing and pack as much as I could into it because I don't feel like I have been able to pin in to anything fully uh on my own life yet so I think there's a whole lot to still kind of do and synthesize and stuff and I think a comic series is perfect for that different issues and stuff and Baz Luhrmann music which is absolutely bonkers um it would be perfect for it that's something I'm gonna have to look up on YouTube when we're done yeah look up Baz it's, it's great well, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Ryan, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I, I had a blast. Like uh, like I always already said, you know, the, the coolest thing about comics is that there are always comic fans looking to connect with each other. So thank you for going out of your way to do that. Um, I love talking about comics, uh, and I really hope people read more comics, not even my own. Before I let you go. Where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find all of your works uh, on the internet? So you can find me. Oh, there's an awesome link that you made, which is great. There, I have a link tree at the bottom, which is linktree dash Ryan OC for you. That's also all my social media. So you'll find me at Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, Merge Rum is part of the Bebop Volume 2, uh, which is uh, pre uh, on pre-order now if you go to uh, birdseyecomics.com and uh, Mac Maverick is midway through its second arc it's available on Webtoons and Tapas if you just Google Mac Maverick you can find it which is really really great um, and Target is coming to <laughs> uh, but we're going to have an announcement of where Target is going to be uh, and how you're going to be able to get your hands on it and it's sooner than you think which is really really awesome so uh, thank you so much for having me um, I also really, really implore you to find all of my co-creators 
Uh, Amanda Dora Dor is on Instagram at her name. Uh, and uh, Danielle Draws is uh, on uh, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, D Noonan uh, is at uh, D, oh, D Noonan Draws at twitter.com. And Desi Draws Things is Desi Alicea Apontes. So follow all of them because they post art, which honestly is super, super cool. And I'll post weird memes sometimes. Well, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because that's really all I really post to these days, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia and our Patreon, you know, help support the channel. It's been on for 15 years, you know. Do go the lowest tier really doesn't matter but whatever you support i do greatly appreciate it which is patreon.com forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking that's awesome support your local comic shop nice yeah